Welcome to a special edition of HuffPost Live. We're here in Boston at the Old South Meeting House, which is the birthplace of the actual Tea Party. Uh -huh. the, the, <laughs> the real one. The real one. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'll, I'll be your host. I'm, I'm Ryan Grimm of the Huffington Post. And I'm joined here by two people who have uh, written books that have searched the top of Amazon, New York Times bestseller list. Uh, the, the first one, Capital in the 21st Century by uh, Professor Thomas Piketty. The, the second by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, A Fighting Chance. Mm -hmm. so, so, Sen Senator Warren's book makes the case that the, the system is rigged on, beha on behalf of the rich and against the middle class. Professor Piketty's book uh, makes the same case as Senator Elizabeth Warren's does, except he makes the empirical point that this has been happening for 250 or more years. So, S Senator Warren, I w actually wanted to start with you and ask you, tell us what you made of Capital. Okay. So, I will get to describe your book in front of you. I like this. Um, <laughs> so, I saw it as a book that had a pretty straightforward thesis. The rich get richer and everybody else gets poor. That kind of says what this book is about and what, what uh, Dr. Piketty has done is drawn the data together to show how this has happened across countries, across time. And I have to say, the first thing I thought when I read this book, or one of the first things, is I thought George Bush Sr. was right. Remember when he called trickle-down economics voodoo economics? <laughs> Dr. Piketty assembled a lot of data to show that, in fact, Wealth does not trickle down, it trickles up. It trickles from everyone else to those who are rich. And he demonstrates with his data that it keeps happening, as I said, over time and over country. Right. Does that sound about right? Well, that's one <laughs> possible outcome, but you know, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, inexorable or there's nothing uh, natural in there. You know, it really depends on the set of forces. It depends on the institutions that we choose. It depends on our policies, not only in the fiscal domain, but also, you know, education, you know, the diffusion of education and knowledge can be a powerful force pushing toward a reduction in inequality, both between countries and also within countries, you know, assuming everybody has access to the, the, the skills, the, the, the jobs. Uh, and, and so, you know, educational institution, institution in the, in the labor market, you know, minimum wages, you know, is part of, of, of uh, uh, you know, what can make a difference. You know, right now the real level, the real value of the minimum wage at the federal level in the U.S. is less than what it was in the 1960s, which is quite peculiar that, you know, a country uh, half a century later has a lower uh, real minimum wage. And of course, taxation of income, inherited wealth, which to a large extent was invented in this country, you know, tax progressivity. Uh, we, you know, we, can make yeah. a difference. So all these different forces, you know, education, social institution, taxation, can, can, and sometime in the past, you know, have been able to produce uh, different outcomes, again, particularly in this country. But, you know, going to your point about whether or not this is inexorable, whether or not it has to be this way, I think it's two points that are made simultaneously. It's why I started with, with the question about trickle-down economics. Because I think the, the myth behind trickle-down economics was that if we let the rich retain more of their wealth, somehow that's going to flow down to everyone else and it will make us all wealthier. And so I read the first part of this message as that's just simply not true. It doesn't work that way. It's not, uh, it's not like gravity, that somehow if we hold it up here, it will trickle down over time. But that the second point is also powerfully true. What happens in the distribution of wealth over time depends importantly on the government, on the policies that any government follows that can either make this problem a, a, a better problem, that we can get more equality in an economy, or that we make it a worse problem and exacerbate. And we, we took a lot of questions from, from the public here, and actually a lot of questions were about this particular issue and, and specifically on, on taxation. I wanted to, wanted to read one here from a, this from a Move On member, as a matter of fact, uh, Lars from Georgia. Lars wants to know, how, how do you propose to convince 
more wealthy people that taxing themselves at a fair rate is actually in their own interests as well as ours. Okay, so the, the difference between taxation and voluntary giving uh, is that uh, for taxation, you know, in, tax, in principle, it takes a majority to take decision and, and not everybody has to agree. So, you know, that's the short answer is that, you know, if you wait for, you know, each single individual to be, to be willing to pay more tax, you know, of course, that can take uh, a long time. But, uh, uh, However, know, we're not exactly one person, one vote here anymore. Yeah. Right, so what... No, what not in a post-Citizens yeah, right. United world. No, that's, yeah. uh, that's uh, the biggest danger with rising right. inequality is that at the end it creates, uh, you know, rising uh, access to political voice, political power, and this can make it even more difficult. But, you know, at the same time, we have better information technologies, better opportunities to spread information and to have new forms of political mobilization than ever. So, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as what uh, uh, you know, a number of people seem to, seem to be uh, after they've read my book. And I feel really sad that you know, some people <laughs> were depressed, apparently, after, after they've seen that. And you know, I think there's room for uh, you know, reasonable uh, optimism as well. But you know, it, it, your, your question about how you persuade people that, we should, that they should pay more taxes if, if they already have a great deal. I think part of this, though, goes to the question of the integrity of the tax system itself. A world in which anyone, rich or of moderate means, looks left, looks right, and says, wait a minute, that guy gets a tax loophole, that guy gets to move his property overseas and doesn't get taxed on it, this guy gets a break for moving jobs overseas, that one over there gets a special deal. The cost of that is not just a cost in dollars, it's a cost in integrity in the system. And when, when people feel like we're not all in this together, we're not all sharing, we're not all paying a fair share of our income or our wealth, then I think, I think that what you get is you get this sort of, it all comes unraveled. Mm -hmm. Everyone moves toward, I will pay the least because he's paying the least. Um, He's cheating, so that means there's no reason for me to go ahead and, and, and be scrupulous about what I pay. So I think partly this is about we're at a moment in American history that our tax system has become so riddled with loopholes. I, you talk to small business owners, small business owners pay and pay and pay on taxes. They pay because the loopholes aren't as available to them. But you look at Fortune 500 companies, companies that are profitable, and end up paying zero in taxes. When that happens, the cost is more than the dollars. The cost is the integrity of the system and the sense that we're all in this together. And so the first place, for me, that we have to start this is we have to clean up the tax system we've got. That, that has to be the first step. Okay. So. So, uh, speaking of uh, integrity and uh, the power of big money, you, you've recently been on the receiving end of some of that power. Um, so, I think apparently a lot of people are familiar with this row, with uh, the Financial Times. You, you rebutted this, this this week. Basically, they, they said he made some math errors. It turned out that the Financial Times just simply didn't understand how to do the, the equations. Um, <laughs> So even, even, after that, even after that was pointed out, though, they, they followed up with this. And I want to read, read you their follow-up and get your, get your reaction to it. Uh, this is Chris Giles writing. He said, further debate on many of these items is difficult because Professor Piketty accepts he makes still undocumented adjustments to his data. The sources he has appear to be secondary to Professor Piketty's prior expectations of what the data needs to show. Now, beyond that being an incredibly unself-aware statement, uh, what, what, what would, how, would you, how would you respond to it? And do you plan to respond, or do you think this is over? Uh, I mean, to, to me, well, to me, this particular debate is over. But what, what's not over is, you know, the quest for more uh, transparency about mm -hmm. income and wealth. And, you know, what, what I take from this debate is two things. You know, first, you know, I think people should be afraid more with the realities and with my book. And I think, you know, my book is not the problem. You know, the problem is uh, uh, rising uh -huh. inequality, you know, the fact that the right. top... You know, the fact that top wealth holders uh, have been rising three times faster than the size of the economy, not only in the U.S., but also in Europe, and also at the world level. 
you, you take the ranking of Forbes billionaires and you have them all across magazine all over the world, you know, the top of the list has been rising three times faster than the size of the world economy. Now, if the Financial Times have a different ranking, you know, they should publish it. Right. But apparently they don't have it, so, you know, they should stop. Right. And, uh, but, you know, wh what I take from this, you know, as a positive matter is that, you know, there is a strong lack of uh, transparency, in particular about cross-border assets, mm -hmm. uh, offshore wealth. And, you know, this is really very close to what uh, Elizabeth was saying right now. The, you know, globalization is a positive sum game. And, you know, I am attached to globalization, economic openness. But ultimately, it is the interest of everybody, you know, the rich, uh, big companies, and also the Financial Times that's defending them, uh, uh, that everybody gets a fair share from globalization. And for this, you know, we are going to have a treaty between Europe mm -hmm. and the US, that's one quarter of world GDP plus one quarter of world GDP, that's one half of world GDP, so it's a lot of responsibility. And we cannot just go for more trade liberalization. We also need more regulation, you know, in the social, environmental, and fiscal domain. For instance, we need to make sure that you know, multinationals and very high net worth individuals pay their share, uh, you know, their fair share in taxes. You know, you cannot just make huge profits from uh, free trade and then pay no tax anywhere. You know, you have to find some balance so that everybody is ready to make an effort. You know, what I take from this debate is again, you know, we we, we certainly know too little about the dynamics of wealth and income. You know, I'm trying to produce more data, but you know, it's certainly imperfect. You know, I agree. Uh, with this. In fact, the main reason why I am in favor of, you know, uh, some form of taxation of wealth and cross-border exchange of information and registry of cross-border financial assets is uh, so that we know more about wealth dynamics. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a bit sad that today all we can do is to, to buy magazines to know more information about wealth dynamics. <laughs> and, you know, it would be better if people could read, uh, you know, the uh, official government publications or uh, IMF or Eurostat uh, and better understand what's going on to the different groups in society in terms of wealth and income. Without this democratic transparency and democratic accountability, you know, we cannot adjust our policy and we cannot have, a, a, you know, a rational, uh, peaceful uh, conversation about these important issues. And, and uh, Senator Warren, you, you've been on the... I, I was just yeah. going to say, though, but it sounds to me like you've just explained why there are a lot of people who won't want to see more data about wealth inequality out there. You're right, you're right. But, uh, you know, uh, democratic institutions can be stronger. We hope. So you, you've been on the receiving end yourself of plenty of counterattacks. Any advice for uh, Professor Piketty? <laughs> now, hit back. <laughs> <laughs> So back to inequality. You, so you you argue that uh, it was the shocks of the of the of the two world wars uh, that that lessened inequality uh, throughout much of the, the 20th century. But I'm wondering if if the reverse might actually be true. In other words, was it a, was it a coincidence that on the eve of World War One we had historic levels of inequality? If you look at the situation in Ukraine now, uh, you have high inequality and you have oligarchs battling, battling for resources. Is, is there, you, you demonstrate a connection between war and inequality. Is, does it go the other way? Could there be a connection between inequality and war? Well, I think sometimes extreme inequality, uh, uh, you know, if you don't manage to address it in a sort of rational and peaceful way at the domestic mm -hmm. level, you know, it's very tempting to blame others. So, you know, a nationalist response is sometimes you know, a possible response mm -hmm. to uh, extreme inequality. So you start uh, uh, to blame, uh, you know, foreign workers or to blame uh, your neighbors or to blame... Uh, so certainly, you know, in, in France and in Europe, you know, we could see that a week ago and, you know, people uh, uh, voting for extreme parties partly because, you know, they don't know how to solve their domestic uh, uh, inequality or unemployment problems. So, they, you know, they blame the European Union, they blame Germany, they blame China. You know, there's always someone to blame. So, uh, uh, yes, nationalist response and sometimes, you know, war or, you know, conflict can be uh, uh, aggravated by, by inequality. Now, let me say that, you know, there are many, of course, in history, you know, wars have played an important role in, in you know, changing the, you know, the distribution of income and wealth, particularly in Europe. But, you know, there are more peaceful ways to change <laughs> the distribution. And in fact, you know, the democratic responses 
and you know the rise of uh, uh, you know free schools, the rise of uh, uh, you know social policies, the rise of progressive taxation, which occurred after World War One, after the Great Depression, after World War Two, were partly a response to the war, but were also partly an, a response of the democratic process themselves, and you know particularly, you know I guess in the U.S. Uh, you know, the way progressive taxation of income and inherited wealth was invented in the 1920s and 30s, you know, was not just due to World War I or the Bolshevik mm -hmm. Revolution, you know, which was much less important in the American political scenes than in Europe. And, and still, uh, you know, these new institutions were invented by U.S. democratic institutions. So, you know, there are, there's a lot to learn from our common history, and, you know, we should not... Uh, uh, just believe that these issues uh, started uh, 10 years ago. You know, these issues have been with us forever, and you know, there's, there's a lot to learn by putting them into this broad uh, historical and international perspective. Right. Dr. Piketty has proposed, as probably most of you know, uh, a, a global wealth tax, which is kind of an extension of the property tax to, in, to include a tax on other forms of property, stock, investments, etc. Et uh, it's been called utopian uh, by some people, but the, the income tax was called utopian 100 plus years ago. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, the, the U.S.'s experience with the, with the income tax? Well, you know, it's, it's partly about the notion that we were, we were pretty appalled initially about the idea of an income tax, but we began to tell ourselves a story. And, and as, I, as I listen to Tom talk about this, think about every time how it's the story of our understanding of ourselves and why we're in these economic circumstances. So you talk about one of them is, in cases of extreme inequality, people blaming, political leaders blaming, say it's their fault, it's that group or that other country, and that this can lead us into war. There's also the question of how we describe, at any given time, the, the pressures on, on most people, on the economy. If you feel like Look, this is a work hard, play by the rules economy. And sure, there are some ups and downs in it, but mostly, if I work hard, my family's gonna do okay, and better yet, if I'll cinch my belt a little, work really hard, my kids are gonna have a chance to do a little bit better than that. Their kids will have a chance to do a little bit better than that. And that sets the stage, if you believe that, for everybody to participate in an economy, you get a lot of stability, you get a lot of production, you get a lot of hard work, you get a lot of investment in the future, you build a strong and robust future. At that moment, an income tax is part of it. It's part of how we finance the things we do together. And we do it progressively, partly because people have more, partly because they have been rewarded by what we have done together. And we all have this sense of shared responsibility and shared investment in the outcome. When the thing starts to break apart is when you have people beginning to feel, wait a minute, that's not how the game works anymore. Just to pick an example, those who are rich have managed to help rewrite the rules so they get more and more, so they get breaks in taxes and get to keep more, so the regulations tilt in their favor, so they have better business opportunities, so they have better ability to earn than everyone else who's out there working. And when that starts to happen, when that starts to happen, then what we get is we get, we get a country that's headed in the wrong direction. When people start to feel like, it's not about how hard I work, that I face the risk that I will work hard and end up with nothing. That's when the pieces start to break apart. And so the, the way I see this is we are right to talk about taxes, where taxes should be appropriately uh, placed, which, which parts of wealth and income we want to tax. But it's fundamentally this question about whether or not the game is rigged. And the game right now in America is rigged. It is rigged so that those at the top keep doing better and better, and everyone else is under increasing pressure, is under increasing economic strain. My view of that is why that is happening, is not because it's inexorable, not because it had to be that way, but because those at the top 
can hire the lobbyists, can hire the lawyers, they can now under Citizens United uh, affect the, the electoral system so powerfully that they get a set of rules written over and over and over, year by year by year. The rules don't get better for America's middle class. The rules are getting better for those who are a thin slice at the top. And that is the profound danger that we see from great inequality. And, and there's a very particular way that the system in America is rigged, which you describe well in the book and, ju and just now. Um, I'm curious, in your, in your research, uh, is it similar in other countries, or does inequality uh, grow in, in different ways? Is there, in other words, is the power dynamic uh, the same, but the particular ways that it plays out in different countries different? You know, I think so, some countries have been able to, to build more inclusive institutions than others. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, you know, both in the, uh, you know, in the educational domain, so, you know, like in, in Nordic European countries, you know, although they are in fierce uh, competition with one another, including for their tax system, mm -hmm. they have been able to keep, you know, pretty inclusive uh, system of investment in skills so that, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, not everybody is going to Harvard, but still, you know, they, they, they most, uh, you know, very large part of the population have access to, to uh, high skills and at the end of the day, high paying jobs. And, 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 you know, in other domain as well, you know, I guess uh, institution regarding the financing of political uh, parties and political life, you know, is certainly one of the important difference between uh, a number of European countries and the United right. States uh, these days. So, they, you know, there are very different, you know, social, legal, uh, educational, uh, fiscal institutions that, that can make uh, you know, that can make a huge difference uh, at the end of the day in terms of uh, inequality uh, dynamics. But, but notice the first place Tom goes. He goes to financing opportunity. It's about education. It's about making sure that everybody gets good education so that you've got talented kids who may not have been born into wealthy families but who will still have opportunities. I just expand that by saying it's about investments in infrastructure. Little business wants to start, it needs power to plug in, it needs roads to be able to get its goods to market, it needs educated workers to come in. Making those kinds of investments are the kind of investments for which then everyone feels like, I got a piece of this, I've got an opportunity, I work hard, I play by the rules, I'm going to succeed. But a world in which those investments are undermined, look at something like the Ryan budget, which in effect says, but remember, not no, not you, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> The, but, but look at the basic premise behind the Ryan budget. Preserve lots of loopholes for those at the top, cut taxes right for those at the top, and how do they plan to pay for it? By cutting the investments that create opportunity. Cut the investments in education, in infrastructure, in research, the things that help build a future. That drives us toward more inequality, but more critically, it undercuts the basic premise of this country, of work hard, play by the rules, you've got a stake in the outcome here. And not to drag this in a more pessimistic direction, but... Uh, Could it be in a more pessimistic <laughs> direction? Another, yeah, another, uh, another, another move on, uh, reader, Diane from Florida asked ask this one, how, how will the costs uh, and consequences of climate change uh, interact with economic inequality? Well, you know, I, I think it's nice that you talk about climate change because I think it shows that, you know, we have much more difficult problems to solve than just exchanging bank information you know, between <laughs> countries. And, and, you know, if we are afraid with, you know, Switzerland and the Bahamas and we think they are too strong for us, you know, then what, what are we going to do about climate change? You know, so, you know, I think we, yeah, we have to, to solve, you know, this financial opacity problem, you know, this lack of transparency right away so that we can focus on the real issues. And part of the real issue is yeah, investment in education, investment in clean energy sources, uh, and, and uh, you know, do something you know, serious about climate change. And, and uh, yeah, you know, it's very sad that we are losing so much time, in a way, on, on secondary issues. You know, just making sure that, uh, you know, I, I, I am from a country where even the president was unaware that his budget minister had a bank account in Switzerland, and the budget minister keeps saying, no, I don't have one, because he was sure that, that the French government would never get the information from the Swiss government. So, you know, 
what is this world where we are losing time, where, you know, are we going to be able to get this transmission of information? And at the end of the day, it's only because actually the United States government put sanctions on Swiss banks that this made a difference. So the good news is that, you know, you can make a difference. You know, these small territories are not so powerful because they are small. And if you have proper sanctions, uh, saying, uh, you know, okay, we are all attached to free trade, but, you know, you need to have some fair uh, tax system, uh, we can solve it and move on to much more important issues such as climate change. You know, though, Tom, you separate climate change from much of this other debate over inequality. I think they actually are the same debate occurring in, with, with different words, but think about it this way. We have, what now, tens of millions of people who live right near coasts, just to pick one example. And so what, what's happening right now in the debate in the United States? There are giant industries that pollute, and the consequence is they make immediate profits, and the effects of their pollution will be felt by lots and lots of people around this country and ultimately around the globe. Now, it's in their interest to continue to be able to pollute because they can make short-term profits and everyone else will bear the costs. Think about it. They are able to amass the lobbyists to go to Washington to influence the lawmakers, to influence the regulators, to do everything they can to maintain their opportunities to foul the air and poison the water in order to promote short-term profits. Everyone else who has to pay the price on that doesn't have that same kind of organized ability to make their voices heard in the same way with lobbyists and lawyers in Washington. And so for me, this is just one more example of how we have inequality, of how we have a rigged system where a handful are able to reap benefits at the cost of everyone else. And I think that Climate change, like economic inequality, are both symptoms of the same problem. The same problem of those with power writing the rules too much in their favor and everyone else being left behind. So we, uh, and so we, we, got a, we, got a ton, we, we got a ton of questions uh, submitted on, on one particular issue that jumped out, and that was actually uh, student lending, uh -huh. um, which ties I don't know what the situation is, is in France. Here in, here in the United States, um, there are probably two people up here still have student loans. Um, <laughs> and uh, th there, were, there were a variety of different questions, but two, uh, Barbara from Arkansas and uh, Robert from Oregon, both uh, Move On members, um, asked if you would support uh, some version of uh, student loan forgiveness. Do you think that we're headed in that direction where it's becoming so unsustainable that there might have to be some outright forgiveness? So, so let me do a couple of facts on student right. loans. Uh, uh, you'll sit down on these because, uh, <laughs> all right. So right now we have $1.2 trillion outstanding in student loan debt. 40 million Americans are dealing with outstanding student loans. Uh, mostly young people, although I should add to this that people 60 and over collectively owe about $43 billion in student Six, loans. 60 and over? Yeah, yeah, think about that. Uh, people who've guaranteed other, other loans, uh, who went back to school later in life. So we've got a lot of student loan debt out here. Now, it's starting to be so much debt that it's dragging down the economy. Uh, the reports are starting to pile up from the Fed, from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, from, the department, uh, from the Treasury Department. And what it shows is that people, young people are not buying homes at the rate we would anticipate. They're not starting businesses at the rate we'd anticipate. They're not buying cars. They're just not doing the economic things we should expect them to do because they are so burdened with debt. So we've got a situation, and by the way, one more piece on it, just so we're getting the big data pieces. It's growing, and it's growing fast. Over less than a decade, the amount of student loan debt out there has grown by about 70 percent. So think about that. We are on a fast slope up in terms of debt. 
So what can we do about student loan debt? There are multiple things we can do about the outstanding student loan debt. There are forgiveness programs. We can, that's a piece of it. We could bring down the interest rate on all student loan debt outstanding. <laughs> and, and here's a critical part of that. Keep in mind for student loan debt outstanding. People have refinanced their home mortgages. Now that we're in a low interest rate environment, they have refinanced their business loans. They've refinanced their township loans. You can't refinance your student loans. So people out there are stuck in 7%, 8%, 9%, just wave your hand when I hit your number, 10%, <laughs> yes, there we go, uh, student loan interest rates. The idea is, but this gets us right to the heart of what we're talking about. The idea for a bill right now that we've got pending, we've got more than 30 co-sponsors in the United States Senate, is Bank on Students is the title of it, and it says let's refinance that debt down to 3.86%. That was the, the rate the Republicans in the House and the Senate agreed to last summer for all new student loans issued last year. So we said if that one worked, we'll pick that number, it's a little higher on, on graduate student loans. But let's refinance down to that rate. But here comes the trick in the game. Why does the US government not just refinance that debt? And the answer is because that debt out there at 7%, 8%, 9%, 10% is producing tens of billions of dollars in profits for the United States government. In other words, it's in the government budget right now, just one slice. The debts from 2007 to 2012, just that little slice of loans, is on track to produce $66 billion in profits for the United States government. So to be able to refinance the debt down, we got to find that money somewhere else. The proposal in this bill is to say, fine, we'll pass the Buffett rule. Close up the loopholes so that billionaires pay at least the same rate of taxes that their secretaries pay. But that's why it's so critical right in the middle of the inequality debate and what you started out talking about. This puts us directly, I can't think of a better way to put this, the United States as a country can invest in young people by putting tens of billions of dollars toward reducing the interest rate on student loans. This is even getting to the forgiveness question, but reducing the interest rate. Or the United States government can continue to invest tens of billions of dollars in tax loopholes for billionaires and millionaires. Think about it for a minute. There are lobbyists who will protect everyone of those tax loopholes, who will be there morning, noon, and night to make sure that the Buffett rule does not go through. Those loopholes stay open and billionaires hang on to every single penny that they can now get through those loopholes. What have we got on the other side on student loans? All we've got is our voices and our votes. That's fundamentally the best place I can describe the inequality debate in America today. Is this country going to be run for the billionaires and millionaires, or are the rest of us going to say enough of this, we want to invest instead of in billionaires, we want to invest in our students, we're going to take back our country, we're going to make our voices heard, we're going to make our votes heard. That's what this is about. In fact, this, this, this event is actually sponsored, uh, as people can see on the sign there, by uh, uh, a group known in the United States here as the, the Patriotic Millionaires. And this is a group of more than 100 millionaires and billionaires who are calling for their taxes to be higher. Uh, do you have anything like that in Europe? It, or it, it, uh, you know, in, 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 in Europe and in France in particular, we, we usually don't pay much to go to university, but sometimes we don't get that much in exchange either. So it doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's not, <laughs> 
it's not perfect. You know, I think each country has to invent, you know, nobody has invented the perfect system of higher education, you know, because we need to find ways to combine efficiency and equal opportunity, and you know, that's, that's complicated. But, you know, I think what, what uh, Elizabeth just said, you know, is, is, you know, to me strikes me as extremely important and, you know, a very important move in sort of rethinking uh, access to higher education uh, in this country. I think, the, you know, the level of tuition and, you know, if you look the, the data we have on the, the average income of uh, parents of Harvard undergrad, you know, it's getting a little, uh, a little uh, frightening. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think also, you know, transparency in admission procedure is, uh, you know, maybe even more difficult to make progress on that kind of issue. But, you know, I think, you know, to me, viewed from Europe, you know, this is, uh, this is getting a bit, uh, a bit extreme, you know, the inequality in access to higher education in, in this country. That's not saying that, you know, in Europe we've solved this problem because sometimes, you know, equal access has been solved at the expense of, uh, you know, lower efficiency uh, in, in the university system. So I'm not sure this is necessarily, you know, the right answer. And, you know, it's, uh, we all have to learn from each other's experience and, and, and you know, get moving yeah. in this direction. We, we also got a, a number of questions on the role of free trade in, in inequality um, and, and also uh, the role of organized labor uh, and the decimation of organized labor. You don't, you, don't, you don't write much about labor or organized labor in, in your book, and I was wondering what your, what your take on, the, on labor's role in inequality. And, and also, will, are these free trade agreements, have they been exacerbating inequality by allowing capital a freer flow? Yeah, I think they have. You know, I think it's clear that uh, you know, glo globalization has put uh, you know, low skill and, and medium skilled groups under high pressures mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in rich countries, that's, that's for sure. Now, in, in the book, uh, in the book you know, I, I probably don't talk enough about labor unions, but you know, I guess one of the reasons why the unions are not playing the role today that they used to is, of course, the change in the structure of employment and you know, the decline of manufacturing employment, the rise of services and production in smaller units and different kinds of work you know, has made the, the, you know, the unions of the, of the past uh, you know, less uh, strong to address uh, the problem of the present. And it's actually interesting to see that a number of European countries which used not to have national minimum wages you know, in the past have been actually introducing national minimum wages you know, in, the, in Britain, in Germany. So you know, these are two important European countries where unions used to do the job somehow until uh, you know, 10 or 20 years ago and, and there was no national minimum wage because we thought that unions were the right place to negotiate wages in the different uh, industry. And these two countries, you know, with governments of different political persuasions have been introducing national minimum wages because, you know, this can be a way to conduct a wage policy uh, uh, that's more uh, suitable to, you know, to today's uh, world. So, you know, that's not enough, but, you know, we need to to think about this uh, uh, in light of these uh, evolutions. You know, I, I would add something more about unions. In America, unions help build America's great middle class. They did. And they, and they did that two ways. They did it by getting out and getting workers organized so that there were better working conditions, better pay, those things work, and every one of the benefits that unions negotiated for ultimately worked out for everyone else. They ended up raising wages for union and non-union workers. They ended up getting health benefits for union and non-union workers. But here's the key. The <coughs> second thing that unions did is they were out there as a force to be able to argue for things that were in the interests of working people generally. So unions were on the front line in social security. Unions were on the front line in the fight for Medicare. Unions were on the front line in many of the fights for civil rights. Unions are out there to try to argue for what benefits the middle of America, what benefits working people in America. And I think it is, it's, it's no accident that a big part of what happened with trade policy was that it hit in unionized industries and helped take a lot of the legs out from underneath unionized workers in the United States. And that the consequence is not only economic, the consequence is political. And that we see rising inequality 
at a time when union strength has declined. I think those two are deeply tied to each other. Right. So you, you've called for, the, for, a, for a wealth tax, and we, we have a, a one-time version of that here in the United States that hits maybe one or two people, uh, known as the estate tax. Um, is, is a beefed up estate tax enough, or, or do we need to go to something more annual? Uh, I think we need both. You know, I think the, the estate tax, you know, the tax on inherited wealth, you know, is of course very, very important. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, it's good that it was not suppressed in this country uh, 10 years ago. And, and uh, you know, I, I think it's going to keep being something very important in the future. Now, the reason why we have, why we also need an annual tax on wealth is, well, first, we already have an annual tax on wealth, you know, which is the annual tax on property. Uh, now, the problem with this tax on property is that it's not progressive, you know, it's proportional. Uh, uh, so you pay in proportion to the value of your real estate property. And also, it doesn't take into account financial assets or financial liabilities. So you have people, you know, as, as uh, Elizabeth was saying, that uh, actually have a lot of, uh, you know, very huge debt, either as a student or because of your uh, mortgage. Uh, and sometimes, you know, your debt, you know, your mortgage can be even higher than the value of your property. Uh, so you have, say, you know, an average American family that will have, uh, you know, a house worth, uh, you know, four hundred thousand dollars and a mortgage of three hundred ninety thousand dollars. You know, you, their net wealth is only ten thousand dollars, and sometimes it's even negative. And still, they keep paying the same property tax as someone with no mortgage, and even as someone who, in addition to their four hundred thousand dollar property, will have millions or billions in financial assets. So I think, you know, this is a crazy system of wealth taxation. So the question is not, do we need to introduce taxation of wealth? It's how, how do we make it work better? Right. And you know, the problem is that our property tax system was created about at the same time of this building, you know, which is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, two centuries ago or two centuries and a half ago, uh, uh, at a time where property was about real estate property and land property, and there was no very little financial assets or financial liabilities. And this has not been changed, you know, for 250 years. So, of course, this is not uh, the right way, I think, to tax wealth in the 21st century. So, you know, what I would propose, you know, if I could rewrite the U.S. tax code right away in this room with, with well, I have one senator, so that's enough, <laughs> that's enough to have a majority or a super oh, majority. <laughs> You know, I will just take the same tax revenue that the property tax is already generating. You know, I will not increase it. I will keep it exactly as it is, but I will transform it into a progressive tax on net wealth so that, in effect, I will reduce the property tax for you know, 90 percent of Americans who have very little net wealth because, you know, they have a little bit of real estate properties, they have huge mortgage, huge debt, and I will increase it on people who have uh, millions, uh, like our patriotic millionaires who are uh, asking for that. Uh, and, you know, I think that's perfectly doable technically. You know, it's not as if, uh, you know, everybody's going to go to Mexico or Canada right away if the U.S. does that. You know, the real problem is a problem of internal organization, which is that, of course, the property tax is a local matter. You have all sorts of local variation. But, you know, it was the same one century ago with the income tax. You know, according to the Constitution, you know, the federal government could not do anything. And, and then, you know, things happen. You know, sometimes things happen and we did not plan them to happen. And so I'm not terribly impressed, you know, by those who know in advance, you know, what will or will not happen. You know, I think, uh, you know, the tax system has to adapt to, you know, whatever problem we have to solve. And it may take time, but, you know, I guess talking about it is the best way to try to make it happen one day. How's, how's that bill sound, Senator Warren? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Uh, I'm in. Uh, so. I, I, you know, but in on the notion that we have to rewrite our tax code. And, and I was just thinking about a part of the, what you're talking about with the state taxes. There's a fundamental question in this country. Which do we think deserves reward? Is it those who work hard and who are smart, who get out there and make something happen, or those who were born into the right families and who are protected by a tax code that says generation after generation, they never even have to work. They just get out there and live off what's happened a generation before, two generations before, three generations before. And we have prided ourselves as a country, being built by a country of people who get out there and work, people who get out there and make it happen. Our tax system has to reflect that same value. 
It has to reflect the importance of work and people who achieve and people who accomplish over being born into wealth. And I think that's, that's how this has to go. So we've got, do we have, we have, we have time for one more question. I, I w wanted to read a uh, little portion of your book to you and get you, see if you wanted to elaborate it on okay. it a little bit. You write, uh, you write I, I worry that we're running out of time. So I am determined, fiercely determined, to do everything I can to help us once again be the America that creates opportunities for anyone who works hard and plays by the rules. Your last line of the book is, I believe in us. I believe in what we can do together and what we will do together. All we need is a fighting chance. Now, I imagine some people in this room could probably think of something that you could do uh, <laughs> if you did everything in your power. Uh, Professor Pickett, he's not eligible for this question. He wasn't born in the United States. So, what do you think? You know, um... I do believe in us, and I, I believe in us on days like this, uh, on a morning where a whole lot of people come together uh, to talk about ideas, to talk about two books, um, because what we're talking about in here is we're talking about economics, we're talking about power, but we're also talking about values. This is a moment in time for our country and I believe for our world. A moment in time when we decide who we are as a people and what kind of a future we are going to build. Um, as your book shows, it's tough. It is an uphill climb. It will not happen naturally that the world will even back out. But what it also shows is that these are not natural forces that make it happen. It's a set of rules by which we govern ourselves. And here in America, we the people get to decide what the rules are. So I get how hard this is. This is about concentrated money and power on one side, but it's about our values, our voices, and our votes on our side. I believe we can fight back. I believe we can win. I believe it. <laughs>